Well, here we are on a typical Los Angeles afternoon with a high school band tootling away for a movie on the greensward below us here in Griffith Park. I'm Charles Champlin and I write movie reviews, although not usually until the movie is completed. Occasionally I also wander in front of television cameras trying to act like a perfect host. The nearest I've come to commercials were some pledge night pitches for KCET. But what we have here is not a commercial but a testimonial to a director I admire very much. When I started co-hosting KCET's City Watchers program, Jerry Hughes was its director, and we grew up together, so to speak. With Jerry Hughes at the console, the series grew up too, and went on to win four Emmys. Jerry and I went national with Film Odyssey, a weekly showcase of classic movies that aired on 212 public television stations. I introduced the films and afterwards interviewed some of the great filmmakers of our time, Jean Renoir, Fritz Lang, Alfred Hitchcock. I must say that Jerry's handling of these men was as distinguished as the gentlemen themselves. The fact that people like to be scared. Mm -hmm. They pay money to go on a roller coaster to be scared. They get mm -hmm. off giggling, of course, mm -hmm. just as much as in Disneyland, Disneyland they pay money to go into the haunted house. Mm -hmm but they'll come out laughing, you see. And I think this dates back uh, to when the mother uh, scares her three months old baby. Mm -hmm. She goes, boo. I think of myself as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got into an argument once at a, at a film conference with, uh, with George Cooker, who really doesn't like the, the word filmmaker. I mean, he likens it to toy maker. And I think that's a real nice thing. I th like being thought of as a toy maker that makes films. The folks back home in Pittsburgh know Michael Keaton by his real name, Michael Douglas. He changed his name after coming to Hollywood to avoid confusion with that other Michael Douglas. But the hundreds of fans who turned out for their favorite son's return weren't confused at all about which Michael they came to see. Hey, Mayor. <laughs> He may be the star of Batman Returns, but when Michael Keaton comes home to Pittsburgh, he's always been treated like family, especially when he gets together with his own. So, Jerry, what the hell's happening here? Well, we're waiting for Paul. Hey, look, you're here. Oh, we're always waiting for Paul. Do you think the movies generally are getting, because we have all this technology and special effects, do you think they're getting too violent? They're, they are getting violent, but uh, I, I'll, it sounds like, yeah, movies are violent, but my movie's not. My, my movie is my movie. Batman is a... Uh, harsh in some respects like that, but it's almost not cartoony in the sense that it's stupid, it's another world. Once you enter this movie, you enter the world of Gotham City, which is not a real world. And mostly what it is is blowing up, thing like buildings blowing up. It's not really, I gotta wrap this up, it's not really people being shot or graphic, harmful, mean-spirited violence in that sense, no. Here you created something on paper. Now you're in here trying to, both by yourself and with George's direction, make that person a real person. Tell mm -hmm. me about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't, I didn't write it for me. Um, There's certainly not to act in. I, I, I wrote the original story in 1971 when I was working in a laundry. And uh, at that time I was selling some short stories to men's magazines and it was one of these things where we were trying to stay a jump ahead of the phone company. And Geordi, the story about Geordi was originally the first chapter of a, a busted novel and didn't seem to have any place to go after Jordy, because he was really the only guy that I cared about. Did you uh, did you read the book before you read the script? No, no, after. After I read the script. Did you get anything out of the book that helped you prepare for this? Yeah, I think I think you always can get something out of the book. Um, a book that, that is going to be made into... Uh, I mean, that's the source. That's where it all came from. So, um, absolutely. I mean, uh, there are things in there that, that uh, Stephen King writes about that can't be in the movie because of it, it just wouldn't translate properly. So you can always get a good backlog of information that, you know, it's very useful. You uh, uh, research your roles in uh, Color of Money, you learn how to play pole. Yeah. You still, still play pole? I, I, I don't play that much, you know, I can't play half as good now. Charlie Bird, you learned to play the sax? Yes, and then... How did you research this one, or did you? This is difficult. Uh, I the opportunity to uh, meet with different hitmen is, uh, is a little different. They choose to have their own anonymity levels and stuff like that. Basically, you have to read. And uh, I got a chance to read 
and I got a chance to talk to some officers. And then I, I, I try to go into a little bit of, the, of that place where I think he might reside or go to, the kind of bars he might go to, the kind of people. Uh, you, you mentioned the word uh, diehard. That's kind of a comparison. Do you uh, like to compare yourself to others? No, it's like uh, when I'm saying, when I, when I talk about diehard, it, it's like uh, it will be very fast. Uh, in, 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 like a, a bullet, it, it will go so fast, the story will go so fast, we'll have a lots of action, no time to rest. Are some of these things that you uh, stick your neck out for, as you do, uh, would you like to take some of these causes and, and do movies? Do you think be... I don't have any causes. Well, things that you don't think maybe are right. They're not mine. They're not your they belong to you and or all of them. everybody. Right. <laughs> They're not you mine. I didn't invent any uh, any cause. No, I don't. I, I I I try to work in areas of peace and social justice. I don't think you can separate them. If you want peace, you must work for justice. You want justice, work for peace. They're intricately connected. The, when we're dealing with uh, the titles passed away with coffins and awake scene, which is a better part of the movie. What makes it funny? We do, I hope. Yeah, it's a good script. Um, people. That's what makes it funny. People are funny. Uh, it's a good study on people. You ever been on Irish Week? Yeah. Pretty true to life? Um, well, I've been to a real Irish Week in Ireland, which is um, <laughs> it's a bit different to this. This is, a, this, is a, this is an American Irish Week. The Irish Irish Week is really crazy. Goes on for days and goes on for days, and the drinking goes on for days, and the bodies moved around, and you know. Background. Background. Action. Cassie, I gotta talk to you. Not now. I'm praying. I love you. Oh, I love you too, Johnny. No, no, I mean I love you that, that way. Which way? The other way. At first, I thought it was just because I was intrigued by what you were, by what you know of my father. Oh, tell me I'm not hearing this. Then it this. turned into something else. But Johnny, Johnny, I, just I wait, slow down. Day and I, I, I thought to myself, this is someone who could play a role in my new life. Yeah, what role? What new life? Someone I could start over again with. What about your wife? Amy? Remember Amy, your wife? I love Amy. But not like this. But was it the dress? I never should have let you buy me Look, the dress. I know That's what you're going to say. Good. Tell me about Cassie. <laughs> Cassie um, is a woman who shows up at this funeral and uh, sort of makes an embarrassing entrance, just walks right in, all decked out in black and what she imagines is the proper attire for an Irish wake and looking a little bit uh, too voluptuous for the occasion. You know, what I think is interesting, me, Rosie Perez, does not believe Denise. She, I, be, uh, I believe that Denise got her face slashed. I mean, it's there, it's evident. And I believe that she was a victim of a violent crime, that someone did slash her face. And, um, and in the matter that she said it did. The defense attorney always has to assume that he's going to give his, his client the best job, whether he's guilty or innocent or whatever. That's their job. As a prosecuting attorney, do you prosecute because you believe the victim or because you think you have a good case? Well, I'm not a lawyer. You know, right. Right. I'm an actress, and as an actress, you know, I when I was talking to different DAs, I said, you know, what do you do if you don't believe the, you know, the complainant? What happens if and they say you just have to, we well, have to win your case. That's all you really, that's all your job is, is to do the best within your power to represent your client. In doing this role, is there anything about uh, that profession that might interest you? About being a lawyer? Oh, God, no. <laughs> God, no. There's too many of them already, and now they're advertising on TV, and it's disgusting. There are, there's more ambulance chasers than there are good lawyers, but there are good lawyers out there. There's just not too many of them, unfortunately. And when you, take, when you go for things, projects that are challenging, whatever, you may not always, may, project may not be always perfect. And, no shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can, so, all I can do is go out there and do the best I can. Uh. Um, one of the good things about that uh, tape that you did was it shows basically you can hear really clearly what the RPMs are. So I was able to see 
where the um, I'm out of the power band and where I have to increase the RPMs through the middle of a corner in order to be able to get better speed on the straightaway. Can you tell me a little bit about the scene we're going to see a little bit today that you're going to do in the church? Oh, well, um, it's not really a, uh, it's a very grand scene. I mean, at this point, I believe that they're waiting for the diagnosis, which came through after the Easter, day after. the day after. And, uh, and having trusted the great gods of medicine and now going to the great god himself and are waiting uh, in hopes of some kind of good news, I suppose, the next day. You know? and it, it begins their journey, in a way. Talk like you were talking about lunch in Italian. Coach them a little bit in Italian. Uh, well, I didn't learn my Italian from Augusto. No. I, I learned it from a very beautiful little Italian girl. That's, that's right. <laughs> Which gives a great insight. But uh, I can't speak really Italian other than what I speak in the script. Uh, and then I can only do it good for maybe one take, you know. That's Why exactly. is it difficult to find good scripts for people over 30? Oh, listen, if, if you're a big name, if you, uh, you know, if you've created a sensation in films in uh, more ways than one, you get all the scripts in the world. Like, uh, oh, you know, unfortunately I forget names, but uh, I mean, there are about three that get all the scripts that are, are written. I've never asked anybody to tell me this on camera. But how old are you really? <laughs> this is for these people that made the mistake. <laughs> Give me, what's your birthday? March 25th. March 25th, so March, next March 25th, you're going to get it right. Actually, this March 25th just passed. I turned 40. Oh, God, I said it! <laughs> That's horrible, because I, I think I can still pass for quite a bit younger than that, you know? So, it's, uh, it's upsetting, it's an upsetting thing to to have happened to an actress in America. For the stars, the new romantic comedy Cemetery Club is an actor's family reunion. Ellen Burstyn and Diane Ladd made friends on Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore back in the 70s. Olympia Dukakis and Danny Aiello worked together on Moonstruck, and now all four are starting the single life in a cemetery. Action! Old days ruined. Shut to hell. Doris! Doris! Sorry, Avery, for God's sakes. You stand in Abe's grave as if he had died yesterday. And that is the way I will stand for as long as I live. For as long as you live? Good! So from now on, you can do it without me. As of right now, I officially resign from this, this cemetery club. All right, you two. Now, come on. Don't be like that. I have had it up to here. Here! Because God gave a cemetery. I refuse to be in a club where half the members are dead. That? That? is a terrible thing to say. I guarantee you that if we took a roll call right now, three of the members would be locked absent. And that is why we visit them. Instead of visiting the old members, we should be out there scouting around for replacements. Where are you going? To the box. Good. Esther, you want to keep trimming the ivy? You can do it with Doris. I don't know what's happening with Danny Aiello at this age, you know. I'm a man who's been married to the same woman for 37 years, so if I had to go out with a young girl, I wouldn't know what to do. They would actually have to tell me. And I'm telling you, when I have a love scene in front of people, I am nervous. Now, I did The Pickle with Paul Mazursky, which may be out sometime in February, in which I make love to four women. Now, in all my career as an actor, I haven't made love. I mean, as a, as, as a person in life, I haven't made love to four women. But in that picture, I'm making love to four. In this picture, I'm making love to two. And, of course, in The Mistress, I'm making love to one. So I don't know what my future brings, but it seems to be that I'm heading down the right road. <laughs> Cary Grant, I'm not. You know. You're happy with your career? Close. Oh, yeah. I, I certainly could not have been happier for my I think I'm probably one of the lucky actors out there. Background action! <laughs> Wait a minute, Walter's trying <laughs> Get the real cameras! Go check it out. How do you feel about it? Getting out of purgatory. And the wonderful thing is, it may be before long, the place won't be purgatory anymore. 
Judge Bell, is this the most satisfying case you've ever tried? I didn't try it. The thing you must do as an actor, you must, by all stretches of the imagination, by all costs, you must avoid what the author has written for you to do. Like he looks at him feigning innocence. Can't do that. The author writes that so that producers will have something to read. They'll say, ah, feigning innocence. No, you can't do that. The actor must, did Shakespeare ever tell the actors how to act? You know, I once did that in a movie. I had a line, I was a doctor, and I said to Richard Egan, I said, I remember when you first came to see me, you had an ingrown toenail, because <laughs> it says chuckle. But I didn't chuckle, I hated it. I hated the word chuckle, so I said, I remember when you first came to see me, you had an ingrown toenail, a chuckly, and then I heard the, the, the director say, cut. He said, what did you say after ingrown toenail? I said, a chuckly, but I don't know what a chuckly is. He said, no, you're supposed to chuckle there. And I said, chuckle, what does that mean? I don't know what that means. And Richard Egan said, he's a New York actor, he just wants to start an argument. <clears throat> They say you used to, in the early days, argue a lot with directors. Oh, the only way to do it. The only way you can get into your part, the only way the emotion can be right, you had to fight with directors. You had to throw them out of the theater. You had to throw the script at them. You had to curse them. And you had to disagree with them. Whether you were right or wrong, you just had to disagree with them so that you could get some basis some feeling for what you're doing. A fascinating day for me to watch you go through this process. Uh, what was it, like three hours? Uh, I wish it was three. I think, Harry, we started at a quarter to one and it is now six. You figure that out. Five hours and 15 minutes. Yeah, it was fun to watch Peter Falk do the baking. He really got, uh, he really got the hang of it. He knew, I mean, he knew how to handle the dough and everything. And who says you can't teach an old dog new tricks? <laughs> That's not true. Did you know he was a cook in the merchant room? Yeah, but he didn't bake, as far as I understand, right? I mean, yeah. unless he's holding out on he us. He made pork chops. He's trying to make us think yeah. that he knew he didn't know it, and then he learned it, yeah. I guess. He was still working. He had a job as a baker. He was 105, 106 years old. Um, I think that's getting more and more, Jerry. I think, you know, people are living longer, and more and more people are running around over 100. And this idea of retiring when you're 65, that's, that's got to change. Need characters in this, and especially uh, I think everybody's going to fall in love with Peter Falk, and, and the fact that yeah. he's uh, he's an old guy, and a lot of times you just kind of store those people away. You know, here this man gets very involved in your life. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell us the story about your grandfather. Oh, okay. Well, when I first saw Peter Falk in makeup, I mean, the first thing I I said to him was, "Oh my God, you look just like my pop up," and he and he laughed and goes, "I look just like my pop up." Evidently, he had a pop up too that he called his grandfather pop up, and my pop up was my great grandfather, who um, who I used to sit with when I was a really teeny kid and watch the fights and eat chocolate covered cherries and stuff. And also, coincidentally, my great grandfather was a baker, which is what Peter Falk's character is. So it was kind of it kind of really brought back all that stuff. You know my my relationship with my great grandfather and what that was like, and it was it was fun to see it sort of repeated that way. It seems to me you were uh, doing films, winning Oscars in the fifties and sixties when the studios controlled the yeah. product and everything else, and that seems to have changed a lot. It has. I, I it it was more comfortable. You worked in the studios and you had a time to prepare a role. As an as an actor, just doing what you're doing in this movie more challenging you because you have to take the depth of character. Absolutely. I haven't done anything to date that's been this challenging. It's, uh, but it's great. I mean, I hope to continue to do work like this for the rest of my career, you know. This is what it's all about. This is what I wanted to do from the very beginning, maybe. I wasn't able to do it in the beginning. It's taken me time to learn about myself, to have the courage to open up, to have the courage to just allow myself to go into those places that I rarely go into even in my own life, you know, out of fear. So I've grown, a, I think I'm growing as a person. I hope I am. That's, to me, what the best acting is about. A good director has to be as tough as a linebacker and as sensitive as a poet. He'd better be quick and resourceful, an artist, 
a reporter, a leader, and a man who commands respect because he knows his job. Jerry grew up with television. He's been everything from a cable puller to producer. He's done live television, and tape, and film, but now he has more than 50 credits to his name. Jerry has a keen eye, sensitive intelligence, lively imagination, and a distinctive style. He's put nervous guests at their ease and their nervous host as well, for which I'm forever grateful. If I were to be asked what really makes a good director, I'd say all the things I've just said about Jerry Hughes. Thanks for watching.